I've been working on the rainforest for nearly 30 years and was pretty engaged and involved and busy and overworked and definitely didn't have room for another issue in my life. So I struggled long and hard to prevent, uh, you know, climate kind of grabbing hold of me because, uh, you know, I hate to learn new things and, uh, and I'd already, you know, I mean, I'm 60, you know. <laughs> but um, it was really what... Uh, um, there was two things. The first one was reading Ross Gelbspan's book Boiling Point and for the first time really letting it in, you know, what was happening and how serious and how urgent. And then the second one was that as the evidence, uh, as the evidence mounted as to the role of rainforest destruction in global warming, that uh, at, at least a quarter of the global warming gases come from the destruction of tropical forests, from the burning and the clearing and the logging of tropical forests. And... Uh, so once this is understood, perhaps, you know, all of the efforts that we've been making all of these years, which really haven't amounted to much, you know, we've saved a little bit here and a little bit there, but, uh, but really, uh, for every bit of forest that's been saved, there's been a hundred times as much lost. And so, uh, and so perhaps this issue offers an opportunity to finally um, make some real progress in the conservation of rainforests. And then the issue cuts the other way as well in that the predictions are that if the uh, global temperature is allowed to rise by an average of 3 degrees centigrade, about 5 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in this century, that um, nearly all the tropical forests will disappear. The Amazon will turn into a savanna and um, <clears throat> already with uh, only about 1 degree of warming that's taken place so far, there are vast swathes of forest that are dying in the northern hemisphere, in the north of Canada, in the north of Siberia, where the temperatures have gone up more than average and where unusually mild winters are allowing beetles to survive that would always previously be killed by the harsh winters and these beetles are decimating the forests. So although, uh, although I'm not an expert, I do have uh, a number of experts on my team and one of those is Ross Gelbspan, the person who has woken so many people up. And he became involved about 12 years ago when he first learned that ExxonMobil and other oil companies were paying scientists under the table to make it look as if there was still scientific controversy about the fact of global warming. When even 12 years ago, the science was in and there was no longer any controversy. And um, now, 12 years later, we have the strongest consensus in the history of science. Not about every detail, but about the fact that global warming has happened, is happening, and will continue to happen um, now, regardless of anything that we do, that, that uh, because of the latency of uh, the warming that takes place after we release the pollution that creates it, uh, even if we were somehow miraculously able to stop any further global warming polluting gases from entering the atmosphere, we'd still be faced with at least as much warming as we've already experienced. That is, at least another one degree uh, couldn't be prevented because it's already underway, it's already been created. Unintentionally, we have set in motion massive systems of the planet with huge amounts of inertia that have kept this Earth hospitable for 10,000 years. We have heated the deep oceans, uh, we have loosed a wave of violent weather. We've altered the timing of the seasons. We're living on an increasingly narrow margin of stability, and the evidence is all around us. Um, from my perspective, the cr climate crisis clusters together three dimensions. Its natural dimension, its energy dimension, and its economic dimension. Its natural dimension is truly of cosmic proportion. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere traps in heat. For 10,000 years, we had the same amount, 280 parts per million, until about 150 years ago when the world began to industrialize. That 280 is now up to 379. That is a level this planet has not experienced for at least 420,000 years. Uh, unchecked, that will double later in the century to 560, and that correlates with an increase in the average global temperature of 3 to 10 degrees 
And for context, the last ice age was only five to nine degrees colder than our current climate. Each year we're putting about seven billion tons of carbon into an atmosphere whose upper extent is about 10 miles overhead. Uh, its second dimension, which is its energy dimension, is really staggering to contemplate. Basically, to allow the climate to restabilize requires nothing less than rewiring the entire globe and replacing every oil-burning furnace, every coal-burning generating plant, every gasoline-burning car with climate-friendly and renewable energy sources. The U.S. spends more than $20 billion a year subsidizing coal and oil. The industrial countries spend about $200 billion a year doing that. We're saying that in, in the industrial countries, take those subsidies away from fossil fuels, put them behind renewables. The oil companies will follow the subsidies and become aggressive developers of fuel cells and solar panels and windmills. As one Argentine climate negotiator said, we are all in the same boat and there's no way half the boat is going to sink. Certainly the person who's had uh, more of an impact in raising this issue into the awareness of the public all around the world is Al Gore, and we owe him a huge debt of gratitude for this. He's been showing his slideshow about this issue for 30 years now. He was a true prophet uh, long, before, uh, we even, long before we even knew that it thought of this as an environmental issue, let alone the environmental issue that was eclipsing all, all the others. And... Uh, that uh, slideshow turned into a PowerPoint presentation and then eventually into the film An Inconvenient Truth. Um, how many people have seen An Inconvenient Truth? Yeah, great. So I, I've... Uh, uh, basically, we decided to do this, uh, this presentation as a, a kind of sequel to the An Inconvenient Truth. We figured, near, we figured nearly everybody... Well, one of the things that was the way that the What You Can Do piece only appeared over the credits. You know, like I felt like yeah. that deserved a bit more attention. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there was a few other things that weren't mentioned in that. So I'm not saying that as criticism because uh, it was the perfect, it was like, uh, you know, in, in volleyball when someone, you know, hits the ball over so that you can have a, ha you know, have a shot. So he's left room for other people to, um, to, to say things as well. And um, uh, when he came to Australia uh, last November to, uh, for the launching of An Inconvenient Truth there, um, he did a training, for a weekend training for climate messengers. You might have heard that he's been training people in this country, about a thousand people so far, to take uh, the PowerPoint presentation um, updated and localised as a live presentation to their local communities. And so 2,000 people applied for the 85 positions for that weekend. And the reason is that Australians are like really at the front line of this issue because of the worst drought in our history that's now in its sixth year and uh, huge areas of agriculture are being abandoned. Tim Flannery, our, our chief scientist and Australian of the Year, uh, won the Australian of the Year award, says that uh, this is not something that's going to pass, that, that we just have to get used to the fact that uh, uh, the climate will find a new equilibrium and it's not going to be nearly as pleasant as the last one that we had. So we're like the canary in the coal mine, and uh, as a result, 93% of Australians in an opinion poll while he was here, while he was in our country, they said that uh, they were concerned about climate change. And uh, the editorial said, uh, when was the last time 93% of Australians agreed about anything? <laughs> um, which is very true, and the answer is uh, the Second World War was the last time that that happened. So, uh, so this is really a huge kind of a thing for us, especially in the face of having, along with your government, the most recalcitrant, backward government in the world as far as how to deal with this, that, uh, that uh, uh, Australia and America are the only two countries that refuse to even get involved in the international negotiations. And as I'll explain later, there are no local solutions. Any solution which isn't a global solution is just going to be eclipsed by the wave of carbon that's going to come from China and India and all of the uh, developing countries trying to stay ahead of poverty. Unless we uh, forge uh, a worldwide movement that, that looks at this as a, as, a totally, as a global issue, then none of our local actions are going to be sufficient. None of them are going to amount to anything. So uh, when Al Gore was in Australia, he did a, an interview for ABC television, and I'd like to show you a couple of minutes of that. To me, um, this is so compelling. I think it's the challenge of uh, our lifetimes, and our lifetimes represent the period when the human species will make fateful decisions that uh, will determine the future. 
of human civilization. Now, as to the paralyzing effect of seeing these consequences, that's a, that's a real danger. Uh, and there are people who go, as I say in the movie, from denial to despair without pausing on the intermediate step. And what denial and despair have in common is they both let you off the hook. You don't have to do anything. And actually, the mature approach is that all of us have to take, we have to find our way to it, is to act to solve this. And we can solve it. Despair is completely unjustified. I continued to advocate uh, bold changes, uh, but ran into that brick wall of resistance. And one of the lessons I learned was the need to go to the grassroots level. I don't know if you have that phrase uh, yes, here. Uh, and to, to go to people one by one, community by community, uh, and engage in a, a fairly massive and sustained effort to try to change the minds of people about this crisis. I'm a, I'm a great fan of Al Gore's, but there's something in that clip that I didn't really agree with, and I'd like to uh, look at that for a little while, because that's one of the reasons that uh, I decided to do this uh, particular roadshow. Um, and that is where he said that because we have everything that it takes to solve the crisis, therefore there's absolutely no grounds for despair. And I agree with him that we have everything that it takes, technically speaking, that, that it's not that there are any technical problems, but the political and structural and social change that would have to take place for us to actually solve it are so huge that I don't see any grounds for confidence that we're necessarily going to do that. So the fact, the fact that we're capable of doing it doesn't mean that we will. And in fact, we've been looking at this issue for, you know, two decades now, and this year there's more CO2 being pumped into the atmosphere than any year in history. It's still accelerating, you know, so there's no indication. That, you know, there's lots of lip service being paid. And uh, each day we pump 70 million tonnes of CO2 into, into the atmosphere. So, you know, scientists are predicting that if we allow the temperature to go up to three degrees above the historical levels, uh, something between 20 and 40 percent of all of the species of life on Earth will become extinct during this century. So what could possibly be more grounds for despair than to realise that we're living in, in the middle of such a time? In the whole history of life on Earth, there have only been five previous occasions where this kind of an extinction spasm has taken place, and 30,000 species became extinct in the last 12 months, and something more than that will become extinct in the next 12 months. So I think the reason that he said that about despair was because he's bought into the cultural misunderstanding of the meaning and the value of despair. And he sees despair the way that most of us do, as being some kind of horrible destination that once we go there, all is lost. You know, once we despair, then, um, well, maybe we'll commit suicide or we'll become so depressed we'll never recover or, you know, we'll be crushed by this emotion. Whereas what I've learned from my teacher, Joanna Macy, who some of you will know of, and uh, what I've practiced in the workshops, the deep ecology workshops that I've facilitated for more than 20 years now, is that um, we live in a culture in which there's a profound denial about many of our most important feelings, that we're not supposed to feel despair or rage or terror or anguish about what's happening to our world. You know, when someone says, how are you? The right answer is fine, how are you? You know, and the opportunity to say, well, actually, I'm really in despair about the fact that we're in the middle of the sixth extinction spasm in the last 4,500 million years, that would clearly be the wrong answer, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, if you said that, then someone, they'd want you to lighten up or have a drink or maybe, maybe you need therapy or something like that, you know? But, but the thing about these feelings is that they're not... They're not socially constructed. These feelings are part of our ancient mammalian, reptilian intelligence that has stood the test of time and that has protected us for hundreds of millions of years. And this thinking intelligence, as useful as it is for certain things, is impotent unless it's supported by the rest of our being. That merely to know what's going on changes nothing. And that's the reason. We all know. Everybody knows now. In Australia, everybody really knows. It's like there's more about this subject in the newspaper than anything else, more than the war, more than economics. It's completely taken over the public imagination. 
And still, the government doesn't feel like it has to do anything substantial because it knows that nobody's going to do anything except express concern when they're rung up by the polling organisation. And the reason for that is that we have no passion because the passion is buried underneath these emotions that we daren't, that we daren't look at. And so what uh, I learned from Joanna Macy and what I've found to be true invariably is that when we can create a safe container for those feelings, when we can invite our deepest feelings of anguish and grief and rage and terror and despair about what's happening to our world, when we, when, when we find a safe way of listening to each other and inviting each other, then um, empowerment invariably follows. And then those other feelings of helplessness and hopelessness and what can one person do anyway, and it's all too late, and all of those kind of feelings, they just evaporate, you know. And so uh, the way that we... Ruth and I designed this roadshow was that we would do five or six such presentations like tonight in a certain geographical region and that would be followed by uh, a, a day-long or two day-long workshops on the weekend where people who resonate with this particular part of the program and who would like to see what it feels like to have their despair turned into empowerment can come along and have that as an experience. Yo, listen up. This is your home. It's the only one you've got. This place is pretty, but you can't live there. You can't even get there, so I repeat. This is your home. It's the only one you've got. Cherish it, protect it. It's the only one you're going to get. These guys, they're your neighbors. They ain't going away. They ain't leaving. You have to get along with them. So you have to learn to share. You have to get along. You have to learn to get along. Because they are your neighbors. They're not going away. Okay, all this stuff, the animals, the waters, the sky, the ground, the bugs, the fish, the tacos, the people, they're all connected. Everything is connected. They all depend on one another. If you ignore that, you're doomed. Repeat, doomed. Okay, so listen up. It's all one. Not two worlds, not three, one. Just one. So get it in gear. Remember, all is one. Okay, hit it. Anything that presents itself to us as a solution, unless it's, it's preventing some of the 70 million tonnes of CO2 that's going into our atmosphere every day, unless it's preventing that from happening, then it's either irrelevant or it's part of the problem. Anything that isn't preventing the pollution is not part of the solution. And that includes things that should be part of the solution, like windmills. Windmills should be part of the solution. We need other sources of energy, but unless the windmills are accompanied by, as the windmills are built, the coal-fired plants are being shut down, then all that windmills means is that we have more electricity. If we have more electricity, it means that the electricity is cheaper, and if the electricity is cheaper, then that means that all of the air conditioners get turned up a notch in Phoenix. You know, the, the, the windmills in themselves, the technology is not a solution unless it's part unless it's part of a, of, of a real understanding of the issue, and the issue is that we have to stop, uh, we have to stop putting this pollu pollution out there. And hardly anyone wants to look at that because um, our entire culture is based upon a constantly growing economy which is constantly producing and consuming more goods, and these are the exhaust gases from that process. So that... So that um, you know, when Al Gore says uh, we have all the solutions we need, I believe that that's so, but they are so uh, vast compared to what we're being told. You know, what we're being told about is light bulbs. And light bulbs are important. They're going to be part of the solution, but not if we allow ourselves to be distracted by light bulbs from the far more important parts of the solution. If, if, all, of the, if all of the things that an individual can do you, you know, which includes light bulbs and all the changes in individual behaviour, if all of those were done, um, I don't think it would take care of more than 10 or 15% of the problem. 85 or 90% of the problem can only be dealt with by vast political and social change, and the longer that it takes us to understand that, the more difficult it's going to be and the less likely it's going to be that we're going to succeed before some of the really horrendous feedback loops that are waiting in the wings and that we've been reading about of the methane being released from the tundra and um, the, 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 the chaos of, uh, of um, 
you know, populations being shifted around by sea levels. Like now, we have this window of opportunity to deal with it. You know, if we leave it until, you know, the sea has risen a foot, then we'll have a hundred million refugees to deal with, as well as, uh, you know, as well as global warming. They're saying that ten year, within 10 years we have to turn this thing around and where we're starting from today is that in spite of the huge amount of attention that this issue has received, there is more carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere this year than there was last year. Do you know? So that it doesn't matter how much attention it's received, the industrial juggernaut is just ploughing forward and uh, China is building uh, a new coal-fired power plant every five and a half days and nothing has changed yet, do you know? So it seems to me that the one thing that we can know for sure that we need to do is to begin to educate our community about what's going on and about the urgency of change so that once we do know exactly what to do, uh, people will be prepared. Because what's already becoming clear is that a minor adjustments are not going to be sufficient and that it's going to require vast political and social changes and that this is not going to happen unless the people are ready, you know, and so it's up to us. We're the kind of people who would come out on a beautiful, beautiful Sunday evening to listen to someone talk about such a depressing topic. So we're the ones who are, are already concerned and it's up to us now to educate our people and to make sure that this concern spreads quickly enough so that once the solutions do become clear, uh, people will be ready for them. The next thing I want to say is that one of the reasons why we don't know what the solutions are is because we've lost 10 or 15 valuable years through the efforts of ExxonMobil and those other companies. Um, they've spent tens of millions of dollars and they've been using the same public relations firms as the tobacco industry used in order to conceal the health effects of tobacco before that. These are some of the brightest people in the world and whose only purpose is to make sure that we take as long as possible to understand what's going on and that's why it is taking us such a long time. It's very, very difficult to be able to select the truth from the greenwash that's going on because there are huge political and industrial interests that believe that they can persuade us to accept some form of business as usual disguised as a solution to global warming. And uh, I'd like to give you a couple of examples. The first one, which is really dear to our hearts in Australia, is called geosequestration, or in Australia we call it clean coal. That's the idea that we can continue to pour 70 million tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere every day because we know how to bury it underneath the ground. So I'm not saying that we, that we don't know how to bury it. That there is a technology that can compress the CO2 and then inject it down into certain geological formations, which, as far as I can tell, probably are stable enough to hold it down there for a long time. Whether they'll hold it down there forever is another matter, you know, and of course they have to hold it down there forever or all we're doing is sending a little present to our descendants, uh, you know, like however long down the line say, hey! <laughs> the point is that these geologically stable areas are a long way away from where the CO2 is being produced and in order to construct the pipelines, in order to compress the gas, in order to inject it down in the ground, takes a huge amount of energy, and energy means more coal being burned in order to do the work that, that will create this. So, yes, some CO2 will be, is being injected into the ground, more of it will be injected into the ground, more research is needed, this is a good thing, it's no solution to the problem. The only solution to the problem is to figure out how to stop putting 70 million tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere every day. Anything that pretends to be a solution and that doesn't do that is not a solution, it's just a distraction. It's just some way that to make us feel like we're solving a problem when we're not solving it at all. Another example uh, is uh, the thirst for biofuels, uh, biodiesel, ethanol, these kinds of things. Once again, no doubt these will be part of the mix of solutions years from now we'll see that they're, you know, that it's not that we have to stop running vehicles altogether, we'll find ways of powering vehicles and so on, but the idea that we can go on with this massive movement of vehicles going everywhere for no really good reason that we can see, just force of habit, and that people can commute for hundreds of miles a day to their work and all of these things, all that we have to do is change the kind of fuel that they use, no. It's, 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 it's completely out of the question. If the biodiesel is produced from agricultural waste, 
And if the biodiesel is produced from algae, which is being researched at the moment, neither of these things are commercial yet, but probably will be. These are really good developments. Then that would be a really good idea. But at the moment, it's coming from corn, it's coming from soybeans, it's coming from things that people would otherwise be eating, and so it's increasing the starvation in the world by using agricultural land to grow fuel, or it's coming from the rainforests. In Borneo, um, 10 years ago, the European Union decided that they wanted to have a clean, green source of fuel, and they said that uh, they mandated that a certain amount of the fuel used in Europe would have to come from biological sources and not from fossil sources. The first thing that happened was that the palm oil industry in Borneo suddenly underwent a huge renaissance and an expansion, and millions and millions of acres of rainforest were cleared to create the space for the new palm oil plantations for this new industry very bad idea. Rainforest is one of the best carbon sinks that there is, that if you wanted to keep carbon out of the atmosphere, no better way to do it than to leave it in a rainforest and leave the rainforest standing. Instead, they cut the rainforest down and burned it to make way for the, uh, for, for the plantations. And of course, when you burn rainforest, you create carbon dioxide. But worse than that, by doing it in Borneo, where the rainforest grows, is, it is swamp forest. And what happens there is that instead of the, when the trees die in the normal cycle of their lives, instead of the nutrients being recycled, they get stored as peat under the ground. So those rainforests were sitting, there's 30 times as much carbon under the ground as peat than there was above the ground. And when all of that burned, more CO2 was released in preparing the ground for the plantation than the plantation would replace in its entire lifetime. And uh, last year, the Dutch government apologised for the mistake that they'd made in supporting this bad idea, but of course it was too late for the orangutans and the rainforest and all of the species driven closer to the edge. So what this says is, yes, this is a really serious problem. Uh, I agree with Al Gore that this is the most serious problem that civilization has ever faced. Yes, it's very, very urgent that we do something about it. And no, we can't just grab the first thing that looks like a solution that comes along. We have to, in, in my opinion, the only thing that we really know that we need to do at the moment is um, educate ourselves and educate our communities. Because the solutions are emerging. Within two or three years, I think it will be clear. There's a lot of thought and conversation and research going into finding the right solutions. And what it's looking like is that they're going to require a vast social change and social reorganisation. And unless the community is ready for that, unless people understand both how dire our situation is, how urgent it's going to be that we have to, that we have to make the changes and, and these things, then it's not going to matter who's in power or who's, you know, none of that's going to matter because people aren't going to go for it. I'll give you a couple of examples. A scientific study last year pointed out that if um, the speed limit in this country on the freeways was dropped from you know, whatever it is, up to 75 miles an hour, down to 55 miles an hour, that would save a billion barrels of oil a year. That if, 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 hmm? they, did that. They, they did do that. They did do that. And then, and then Ronald Reagan got elected, right? Okay, so if they did that again, that would save a billion barrels of oil a year because of the nature of the internal, uh, because of the nature of the wind resistance mainly uh, to uh, to a moving object, and so uh, uh, a billion barrels of oil is approximately what this country imports from the Middle East. So everyone can join the dots there, of course, that uh, not only would we save the pollution from a billion barrels of oil a year, but we'd save all that murder and mayhem, and uh, we'd have those hundreds of billions of dollars also available to create an orderly transition from where we are now to where we need to be in order to have a sustainable future. So, not exactly taking us back to the Stone Age, is it, to drop, you know, for everyone to slow down, but um, impossible to imagine. I mean, what politician could possibly get elected on a platform of reducing the speed limit to 50 miles an hour or, or whatever? You know, the only way that that would work is if there was a huge groundswell of understanding. And for various reasons, some of which I've explained, that is not going to come from above. It's not going to be that our leaders will recognise these things and therefore initiate community education programs. The only place that that's going to come from is from ourselves. And it's with that 
conviction that I've sort of hit the road and increased my own already horrible carbon footprint by flying about the place like this is because I really feel that this is an important piece that, uh, that needs to be better understood. One of the aspects of this that has only really come to my attention in the last few months and that I don't think it was mentioned in An Inconvenient Truth for some reason is the role of ruminant animals and the methane that they produce in uh, creating the greenhouse problems. That in Australia, I wish I knew the statistic for the United States, but in Australia, ruminant animals, sheep and cattle, create more global warming gases than all of the industry in the country or all of the transport in the country. The reason for this is that each uh, molecule of methane uh, produces about 25 times as much warming as one molecule of CO2. So that although in volume CO2 is the main culprit, in terms of the actual impact, we've got enough sheep and cows in Australia to eclipse the, either the burning of coal or the burning of oil. And, uh, and so um, this is interesting because this is something, uh, there's only one way really that that's going to change, and that is once again, if everybody understands, joins the dots, understands the situation, and begins to reduce the, their consumption of those particular animals. So once again, it's not exactly the Stone Age. In fact, you don't even have to become a vegetarian. We're just talking about animals with a certain kind of digestive system that creates this methane. And uh, so um, that's just something that everybody needs to know because it's far more significant than what kind of light bulbs we use or uh, even what kind of car we drive uh, is our dietary choices. The second thing about this is that organic produces far less um, CO2 and in fact organic agriculture sequesters the carbon that's already in the air. You know that uh, the chemical based agriculture uses the soil as a kind of a sponge to put chemicals into it. <coughs> Those chemicals kill the life of the soil and then the chemicals, other chemicals will uh, you know feed the plants that are grown. But if we, if we take um, a situation like that and turn it into an organic agriculture then what organic means is that the soil comes to life that there's worms and all kinds of other life starts, you know, like billions of bacteria. The soil is teeming with life and life is made out of carbon. So that the amount of carbon, it's only now being investigated, but it appears that a huge amount of carbon is sequestered merely by the organic nature of things. So the more that we can encourage that, the better. But the part that really speaks to why we need local groups is the question of food miles. Mm -hmm. That uh, you probably have heard that the average item of food travels about 1,500 miles mm -hmm. in this country from where it's grown to where it's consumed. And this is completely unnecessary in most cases. That, uh, you know, that nobody goes into the supermarket saying, uh, give me a lettuce from California. But uh, if that's where the lettuce is grown because of the logic of agribusiness, then, uh, then that's what we're going to get. So this isn't something that an individual can do anything about. But imagine if a community like the one that's in this room was to get serious about this issue and start to, first of all, maybe you've already done this here, identify all of the places where clean food is grown within whatever you decide, a hundred mile radius of where you live, and then begin to support that in every way you can. Make sure that those people are prosperous. Make sure that those people are respected and esteemed for the important role that they play and begin to push the agribusiness back out of our lives and re return us to the situation where I, I don't think it was that many decades ago when all of our food was probably grown very close to home and, and we need to find our way there again before the oil runs out. There's no point in waiting for the oil to run out before we make these changes. After I'd started the roadshow, um, Someone sent me a, a, an interview that Al Gore did with Channel 4 in the United Kingdom and I found it really interesting because in this 40 minute interview, whatever question the interviewer asked him, he always found a way to bring the answer back to the fact that none of the solutions are going to work without this groundswell in the grassroots. So I'd like to play you a few minutes of that. What makes the climate crisis so dangerous is that it could literally end civilization. No matter who was president, no matter who was prime minister, uh, if the Congress was the same or the parliament the same, uh, if the people did not feel this sense of urgency, then the changes would not be made. And I don't think anyone uh, can do what really needs to be done unless and until there is a sea change 
in the way the public feels about this issue. In my country, uh, one of our founders, James Madison, wrote uh, that the most important bulwark of a democracy is a well-informed citizenry. And the way uh, citizens have been informed on this question has left a lot to be desired. When they are truly confronted with the facts, with the scientific consensus about what we're facing, then they will, I am confident, rightly demand of the politicians in all parties that they start offering really meaningful solutions to the crisis. Go see the movie, read the book, inform yourself in other ways, go to the website, and, and try to learn as much as you can about the fact that this is by far the most serious crisis civilization has ever faced. It is a genuine planetary emergency. The normal rules of politics should be set aside. When we have an emergency, we respond and do things that we would not otherwise think possible. The maximum that is considered politically feasible today is still short of the minimum that will solve the crisis. And what that means, very clearly and very simply, is that we have to change the minds of the people in the United States and elsewhere in the world. And we have to put the truth before them in a clear and persuasive and undeniable way so that the people being informed of the truth of our situation will then demand of the politicians and in the process give them the permissions they need to have some courage to make the, the dramatic changes that will solve the crisis. But we don't have much time. And it's on our watch. And the only way in a democracy to get the dramatic changes considered by the leaders, whoever they might be, is for the people to really be seized of the, the crisis and to demand action. Climate action groups of one kind or another have been springing up spontaneously all around the world. There's hundreds of them in Australia. Three weeks ago, I think there was a, a day of action um, called Step It Up. I don't know if anything like that happened here, but more than 1,400 places around the yeah, 1,400 places around the country had uh, had something like that. So this is happening anyway. Within the next few years, uh, a huge change is going to have to take place, and it's up to us to prepare our society for that. I, I believe. I don't think that it could possibly come from anywhere else. That we're the ones who, who are understanding this before the rest of our community and we have to, we have to do something about that to prepare people. So when, uh, when the DVD of An Inconvenient Truth was released in December, uh, Al Gore went on the uh, Oprah Winfrey program and suggested that people have um, house parties, that people get a copy of the DVD and invite any of their friends who haven't seen the film. And I think that's a great idea. Um, and any of you that haven't seen it, the DVD has a special features menu which has got all kinds of stuff that isn't in the film, An Inconvenient Truth, and in particular there's a half hour update that he made 12 months after making the film which has got all kinds of material on population and other issues that he didn't go into much in the film. So I just think that we need an ongoing program of education and reaching out into our neighbourhoods, <coughs> our families and our friends. You know, each of us must know a lot of people who might just as well have been here, do you know? Like, it's not that they decided not to come, they were just doing something else or they didn't hear about it or whatever it is. There's lots of us out there and this is where we have to start reaching out into our communities and, uh, and educating people and, uh, and uh, creating, the, creating the, the force that could <coughs> create the situation where the speed limit is reduced, or where the food is grown locally, or where the $200 billion is no longer going, you know, going to the fossil fuel industry. So now before I hand it over to you, one last clip from Vandana Shiva, a great uh, scientist and activist from India. And we are in a situation where we are literally uh, preparing to wipe out uh, the capacity of our species to survive on this planet. The planet will carry on. It'll adjust, it'll regulate itself in new patterns. The planet will carry on regardless. But the conditions that human beings need for survival, we are changing that so dramatically that I think our generation is going to see within its lifetime conditions become so severe for living. Not because people don't have enough incomes, 
but because the ecological burden of a false growth model is catching up with us. Now's the time, now's the time for every sane person to go beyond this insanity and join hands to just have one project, maintaining the conditions of human survival on this planet. And that's the ecological challenge. Oh 